Good morning, Campbell McCreary here, Amvest Capital in New York City. Welcome to the Amvest Capital Inc. live webinar with Arcana Silver. Uh, Arcana trades as AUN on the venture and as AUNFF on the OTC QX. I uh, hope you enjoy, enjoy today's program. It will be available in replay mode. Um, do send in your questions in the question pane of GoToWebinar and we'll answer your uh, questions in real time uh, during the event. And um, this event will be available about an um, hour after we wrap up at anvestcapital.com slash uh, replays. And uh, on your way out, uh, please share your feedback. Uh, feedback is, is welcome and we'll get to management uh, uh, in short order. Um, Anvest, of course, is a New York-based specialist investment management and corporate finance firm focused solely on the natural resource uh, sector. And um, this call is for informational purposes only. Please read this carefully. Um, very pleased to have with us today, Kevin Drover. Uh, Kevin, going to make you a presenter. Get your screen up and your video. Apologies, my video is on the fritz today. Uh, Kevin is the president, CEO, and director. Uh, more than 40 years of domestic international experience in operations, project development, management, and process re-engineering in developing and with both developing and producing companies. Uh, previously and most recently, he was the COO of Glencairn, responsible for two gold mining operations in Latin America. Before that, it was the VP of operations for Kinross. So without any further ado, Kevin, uh, please uh, pull up your presentation and turn on your webcam. Thank you, sir. Um, good to be here, everybody, and uh, thanks for uh, Let's see your presentation. Okay, coming up here now. Uh, some of you may be familiar with uh, with uh, Orcana, but for uh, any yeah, for those who aren't familiar with it, I will uh, take a, a quick run through just to give you an overview of the company, and then, uh, as Campbell said, we can answer any questions uh, afterwards. I'm just having a little bit of okay, so. I think we're squared away. Uh, the usual uh, 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 forward-looking statements that uh, you know, I may be making some here, so uh, take them with a grain of salt. But for the most part, uh, we're we're not looking too far uh, into the future. We have two uh, projects. We're a silver company. We have two projects. Both are located in the United States. Um, the first, uh, the uh, Revenue Virginia's mine, which is located just right here in southwest Colorado, about a seven hour drive uh, southwest of uh, Denver, easy to get to, or a half hour plane ride into uh, Montrose, and half hour drive into uh, Ure. Uh, that's our flagship. This is the one that we're putting into production and uh, we're, uh, we're about five weeks away from first ore going through the mill. The second one that we have, uh, and uh, you know, it's part of our pipeline uh, that we, as we see it today is the Shafter project in Texas. Texas is a good place to do business. It's uh, about a three hour drive southeast of, of uh, El Paso, uh, or uh, about a half hour drive uh, south of uh, Marpa. And uh, uh, this uh, property, as well as the Revenue Virginia's mine, were fully permitted for production. Both these projects are. The Shafter mine uh, is pretty much pure silver oxide property. Um, it has a 1500 ton a day mill on site, uh, currently on care and maintenance. We are doing some work behind the scenes on the Shafter project with a, uh, a new resource and whatnot. Uh, we hope to have something out in, in the next several months. Uh, but basically Shafter would be our second project that we'd, uh, we'd bring online. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as we, we go through the presentation. But the, the primary focus of this presentation is the Revenue Virginia's Mine, again, located in uh, Southwest Colorado. Um, it's our flagship. It's uh, it's uh, primary silver with some gold uh, and base metals, lead and zinc. About 71% of the revenue is derived from silver. I think about 8% from gold, 15% uh, from lead, and 6% uh, from uh, from uh, zinc. Um, and that's all based on our feasibility study that we did. And the feasibility study was run at $18.50. Uh, as I said previously, we're located in the U.S and fully permitted for production. We're fully funded for production and the restart includes a substantial contingency and 
we, at this point in time, we don't anticipate having to uh, need to raise additional funding. It looks like we're we're in pretty good shape, uh, you know, barring any unforeseen circumstances. Our uh, management is all in place. All of our management is currently here uh, in uh, in Colorado. I moved down from uh, Vancouver uh, late last year uh, to be close to uh, uh, the works, basically, uh, to oversee and be able to report directly to the board. Uh, that's worked very well for us, I think, up to this point in time. But uh, you know, all of our all of our team are here, and our focus is on getting the revenue mine into production. Our uh, cost of production is uh, we're one of the lowest, although we have seen some creep in uh, in uh, in prices, primarily in labor, steel, and, and timber. Um, uh, as per the feasibility study completed by SRK in 2018. Our cost of production, all in sustaining cost of production on a pure silver basis was about eight bucks an ounce. Uh, we're seeing that creep up now with those inflationary pressures on the labor and, and the uh, some of the consumables, upwards of nine to nine fifty an ounce. Uh, still very respectable, but we're certainly seeing some inflationary pressures. Uh, currently, we're doing underground development and mill optimization. Um, we're targeting our first door through the mill uh, well, our date is July 10th, uh, and right now we're still on that schedule. Uh, we don't anticipate uh, at this stage of the game any uh, any difficulty getting there. Uh, so it's very close. It's uh, you know it's less than five weeks from now. So a lot of activity going on here. Uh, would like to talk a little bit about uh, as part of this presentation, you know, the upside uh, to our current reserves that we have. Our current uh, mine life is between six and a half to seven years. However, we see that as uh, multi-decades, uh, as opposed to uh, you know just a few additional years. Um, we have some regional consolidation opportunities as well in this part of the world. We're the only permitted mine mill in Southwest Colorado, where there's been over the last 150 years, probably in the neighborhood of in excess of 3,000 mines operated here at one point in time. So we're uh, we're in a good position to be able to consolidate uh, things that make sense to us. And, uh, uh, from a, a company perspective, and secondly, we we do have the um, uh, the Shafter project in Texas that's fully permitted, and uh, it's at a PEA stage. Uh, we would look to uh, do some additional drilling, uh, do some additional metallurgical work uh, with that, and to complete a feasibility study before we would uh, uh, consider putting that into into production. But uh, we would see most of that happening later this year. A little bit on the company itself, uh, shares outstanding 275 million. I haven't had this updated for the options yet, but we're right around 11 million options now. We just issued some uh, a week or so ago. Uh, warrants 117 million outstanding. I'll just give you a little breakdown on what they are. Uh, but one third of those are at a strike price of 37 and a half cents with about one year uh, left uh, to run before they expire. Another third are at 75 cents with about two years left to run. And the last third is at $1.25 with approximately just, just under three years uh, left to run. Um, current market cap, 272. Our cash balance uh, in the bank right now is 31 million. Uh, we do have some debt. We took on uh, a $28 million debt facility from the Courier Energy out of Houston uh, last year. <clears throat> That's a five-year facility, one-year grace period. The grace period is over in uh, December of this year. It's pre prepayable at any time. Uh, the, uh, the, the debt is reasonably expensive until we reach a production threshold of 400 tons per month. That's at 14.5% plus LIBOR. Uh, dropping to, once we hit that 400 tons a month, um, uh, trigger kind of thing, it drops to 10.5 plus LIBOR. But it is prepayable at any time, and we see cash flow uh, being quite sufficient here in the first uh, a few years of this operation that we could pay this off uh, rather expeditiously if we choose to do so. Or we could replace it with a, a cheaper debt as well once we're in operation of access to cheaper money. Uh, a little bit on our, our comparables uh, grade over here. We're one of the highest grade mines in the world. With a proven and probable reserve, we have uh, our grade as per the feasibility study is 37 ounces per ton. 
uh, we're going to be mining a little bit higher grade than that in the first year or two, are all in sustaining costs uh, on a silver equivalent basis as per the feasibility study was $10.71 an, uh, an ounce, a silver equivalent ounce. And uh, as I said just previously, we've seen creep in that. So we'd be looking more like $12 an ounce on a, on a silver equivalent basis and a $9.950 on a, a pure silver basis. Probably the, the, the I draw your attention to here most appropriately is uh, our uh, peers in the industry, Endeavor, Alexco, America Silver, and so on. Um, you know, uh, probably the closest one to, to us that we should compare ourselves to is Alexco. They're high grade, uh, they're just going into production. Uh, they're in North America, they're in the Yukon in Canada, uh, yet uh, their market cap is double ours. So we, we feel that we've certainly, uh, you know, there are those that would say that Alexco is overvalued, but uh, I would prefer to believe that we're undervalued at this stage of the game, certainly given the price of silver and where we are today. So I, I think there's a lot of opportunity there. Uh, just a quick um, little read on the feasibility study itself. Uh, proven a probable reserve of 21 million uh, ounces at 37 ounces per ton. Our first five years of production is approximately 3.1 million ounces. We'll have higher production than that in the first couple of years. Uh, as I said, all in sustaining costs is there at $8 an ounce, but we, we see that as being closer to $9.50. Uh, based on uh, the, the uh, prices used, the price deck, we used $18.50, $1,300 gold, dollar lead, and $1.20 zinc. Well, lead, zinc and lead were not far off. Gold and silver were considerably higher. So obviously the NPV and the IRR uh, is considerably higher than what we're showing here at the NPV of 75 a million and an IRR 71%. I think the last calculation that we did uh, with a higher uh, price of silver in around the $26 range, we were uh, just right around 178 million NPV and 147% IRR. A picture of the uh, milling facility. Uh, the mill is underground. It's there, fully permanent. We're ready to go with it. Uh, we're doing some upgrades to that, doubling the size of the flotation circuit. Uh, we're uh, uh, removing some bottlenecks where this mill previously ran. We're installing jaw crushers in, instead of uh, cone crushers, uh, adding screens uh, rather than cyclone sizing screens, and adding a rod mill into the circuit. All that equipment is bought it's here on site. We're just doing the installation of it now, but this will all be ready by about mid-June. Uh, so we'll be starting to test some of that. In fact, some of it already we've started to test, like our tailings filters. We put all new cloths on them and uh, you know, run air and water and whatnot through them. So uh, things are going uh, rather nicely there. Uh, just a quick um, uh, view of the site itself. Uh, it's a rather small footprint. We're up at about 10,000 feet in the mountains. Um, the um, passive water treatment system has all been completed and it's currently operating. Uh, the, um, this area right here in the foreground is going to be our uh, tailing storage area. This is uh, best available technology in tailings and dry stack tails. Um, we, are, uh, we got a couple of buildings up here, uh, staging area for materials going underground and a um, uh, dry office building for change room for the underground guys. The mill is located right, right in this area here underground. Uh, and the reason for that was that this mine originally ran from about 1876 up to 1912, give or take. Um, and they didn't uh, shut it down because of it ran out of ore or anything, but they had an avalanche, uh, the mill caught fire as a part of all of that burned down. The Reynolds family that owned it decided that uh, it was better to, uh, and more profitable to focus on their gold properties that they had at the, <coughs> at the time. And the price of silver was rather depressed at the turn of the century. So uh, this thing lay dormant uh, you know, for um, up until 2013. It pretty much stayed in the, in the Reynolds family until, uh, until then. Um, this is a rather important slide uh, in, in terms of you know, where, where we are, where we're going. Um, the, the, we own, of, uh, in this uh, particular area, about, uh, we own nine uh, primary veins. We own a lot more than that, but we'll talk about those nine primary veins. And all of these veins have been in production at one point in time in the past. Uh, the primary vein and the one that we're focused on right now is this one right here called a Virginia's vein. 
We own 16,000 feet of this vein. You can see this vein on the surface uh, and you can trace it. Uh, there, there are some sampling and whatnot along this vein. Uh, so this is our focus for the time being. Um, this gray area that you see here inside this triangle, uh, this is what was mined out uh, from 1876 up to 1912. They took 25 million ounces out of here uh, at a grade of in excess of 60 ounces per ton. Uh, you see there's a pretty sharp cutoff from, from the mined out area and right here. Well, they didn't own this, this particular claim uh, back in those days. So right now, all of our reserves are basically on this. Uh, the purple indi is, is indicated and the, the pink is uh, measured. So our seven years roughly are, lo are located right here in the uh, purple and the pink. Uh, we own all of this to the north and all of this to the south on this. Right now, all of our reserves are located on approximately 4,000 feet of the 16,000 feet. Um, you can see this green area right here. Um, this is inferred and it's, uh, it's not included in the mine plan. However, we, we will be mining this, uh, but we couldn't put it in the feasibility study simply because we had no information on that. We couldn't get a drill hole in it uh, and consequently, you can't uh, you can't add inferred resources into a feasibility study. So we had to go with our indicated up here, which we've got good information on, and our indicated and our measured down here, which we have good information on. But undoubtedly, you know, uh, the epithermal uh, gold systems do not, you know, uh, go. You can prove gold is here. You can prove it, or sorry, silver uh, is here and silver is there. Yet, you know, you, you can't. Uh, uh, say that it is here, but the reality of it is that it is there and we, we'll be mining it. That'll add about another two years to our mine life. So even though we, we say it's six and a half to seven years, it's really closer to nine years with just this. Um, plus we have all of this to the north, as I said, and all of this to the south. Um, these other veins that we have here, the, uh, you know, the Atlas Cumberland, the Montana, the Wheel of Fortune, the Yellow Rose, Klondike, these are all ours. We just have not had the time and really not had the money to uh, be able to focus on exploring those. We are doing some work on the Wheel of Fortune, uh, just a small amount of work, and we expect that we'll, you know, we'll ultimately have a stope uh, out there as well. And that's uh, could, we could probably expect something north of between a half ounce to an ounce per ton and something around 70 ounces per ton of silver out here if we're successful with the. Uh, uh, with that exploration that we are doing. But our primary focus right now, getting ourselves into production uh, in this region right here. And I'll, I'll just go to the next slide. So uh, this area right here, we blew it up just right here. Um, back here, this black line is our main haulage tunnel and main access into the Virginia vein. That's 8,000 feet, roughly a mile and a half all completed, all rehabbed, uh, ready to go, and we've been using it for some time. So that's this magenta line coming in right here, and it comes all the way over to uh, to the end of the uh, Mahogany Hill of Ain. Right now, we're driving three raises up. We're gonna be mining in this area first, and as you can see, we've uh, the yellow is the area that we plan to stoke mine and uh, or block mine, which, whichever you prefer. Uh, right now, the number one LMEC raise is all the way up here to the 1200, which is its uh, ultimate destination. So that one is the, the vertical drive is complete. We're now we'll begin to start to uh, uh, we have to cut stations on each one of these levels. We'll have to timber it and then we'll install a hoist. So that will be what we will move men and materials up and down in for efficiency, getting to work on, on a timely basis. The number two raise sits at the 1500 level and currently the number three raise sits at the 1800 level. We are working on the 1800 level and the 1500. And if you look down right here at the bottom on the 1800, here is what we're doing. So we're, we're right all the way over here. We've turned the corner and we're about right here and we're heading for this vein. This is the vein on the 1800 level, which is right here. And we have really good information in that area. So we're gonna be mining probably something in the north you know, around 40 to 45 ounce per ton material, as far as we can tell right now. We're anxious, of course, to get to the vein and open it up and see it, but we're, you know, we're probably only 60, 70 feet away from it right now. And the idea being is when we, once we intersect the vein, we'll be right here, we'll be going this way, and we'll be going that way, and we'll develop two stopes 
right here in this particular area. At the same time, uh, it'll be a little bit delayed, but by the end of this year, we will also have two stopes de developed on the 1500, and we'll be progressing towards more stopes on the 1200 and, and so on. We need two stopes uh, to provide 270 tons per day to the mill. And uh, that's the design uh, as per the feasibility study and all the numbers that you see in the, in, the, uh, in the feasibility right here is all based on 270 tons per day and on uh, $18.50 $18 silver. Um, we feel that uh, certainly in the future, uh, we have a mill that has a capability of uh, 550 tons per day. So, uh, you know, we're looking to the future. We'll start up at the 270 tons per day. We'll settle down our metallurgy in the mill. We'll settle down our cost and our productivities. Uh, but come the beginning of 2022, we should be in a position where we could bring a third stove on and uh, take that tonnage from the 270 tons per day up to 400 tons per day. That will take us from that three and a half million ounce range that we're looking at under 270 conditions up to about four and a half million. Later in 2000 and early probably 2023, we'd be looking at bringing a fourth stove online and we would uh, come up another 100 tons to 500 tons a day. And that would take us to approximately five and a half million ounces of uh, silver equivalent production a year. In that time period, in 2023, 2024, we would be looking to bring Shafter uh, into production. Shafter looks right now, based on the feasibility study that we did, or sorry, like the PEA that we did, um, it looks like about two and a half, maybe three million ounces a year. So that would take us up to eight, nine million ounces uh, going into 2024. So that's kind of the, the overall plan at this stage of the game. We still have a fair bit of work to do with Shafter, but 18 to 24 months from now, we, we think we, this should be ready to go into production. And with the organic growth here at the revenue mine, you know, we could see, certainly see ourselves uh, you know, at the, uh, the mid-tier producer level. And so just a little bit on uh, regional uh, uh, historic, <coughs> historical production. As you can see, we put in some of the major mines that have been around here, but URA is over here. Telluride was a, a thriving uh, mining town at one time, not so much anymore. Uh, Silverton, of course, uh, again, was uh, uh, very uh, prominent in the mining industry back in the day. But there, there's been over uh, 3,000 uh, mines in this area over the last 150 years. Some of them very, very long life operation. And the Revenue of Virginia's mine, you know, again, was ran for over 46 years. So that's, uh, you know, a, a long time in itself. And it certainly didn't shut down because it ran out of ore. Uh, the uh, Idorado mine ran 120 years. Camp Bird mine ran over 100. Sunnyside was over 100. Shenandoah Dives was over 100. And many of these others in here ran 40, 50 years, 30 years. Uh, and we expect that we will do the same. Uh, you know, from what we can see just on the Virginia's vein, and we did run some mine plans on this internally, uh, but it looks like certainly at 270 tons a day, we could easily run for 20 years just on the Virginia side. Um, so here is a little bit of district consolidation opportunity where, where the, uh, the green and the, uh, and the uh, I guess it's orange color. Um, so uh, this is us right here. Up here is the Ruby Trust uh, mine. It's, uh, it was a high grade uh, direct shipping. Uh, gold uh, project back in in the day and there's been a fair bit of work done on that over the years um, they have a resource on it it's permitted for mining it's about a half hour trucking distance from our mill so this would certainly be of interest to us uh, you know we have no intention to pull into trigger on this just yet our primary focus right now is to get ourselves into production and get cash flowing uh, the Orvis claims are really extensions uh, of our own existing claims uh, this is, uh, you know, a deal that we could do here, and at some point in time in the future, we may very well do that deal as we would with Ruby Trust. But again, we're we're holding our our uh, powder at the moment. The bluegrass patent claim. Uh, this was an interruption in. I'll just show you this. This was the bluegrass claim here. Uh, a lot of people tried to get this to uh, to get the continuous uh, that 16,000 continuous feet of the 
the Virginia stain, but weren't able to do it. We were able to get uh, uh, purchase this, and really what we did was a trade, uh, and we uh, closed that deal in 2019, I believe it was. So we now own the, the uh, 16,000 feet of the Virginia stain continually. The Camp Bird Mine, that's an interesting uh, uh, project that's there. It shut down. It did operate, as I said, for about 100 years or more. It's, it's primary gold with a fair bit of silver. Um, it, it's got some good exploration, but it's got a couple of things that are of interest to us. One is um, they have a 10,000 foot tunnel that basically comes in about 900 feet below us. Uh, which would certainly uh, make it a little bit easier for uh, you know water management and access up even up to our mine. Uh, it's got a couple of other attributes that we like. One is that it's got two permitted tailings ponds. Uh, I mean, we certainly can permit uh, you know more of our tailings uh, ponds if we need them. Right now, we have sufficient capacity in what we have for all of our own reserves and resources. Uh, but uh, that to be able to get a couple of, uh, of ponds that were already permitted, uh, that would be most helpful if you didn't have to go through that process. And secondly, they have a permitted mill site. Uh, as you saw, our mill is, uh, is underground, so being able to expand that as uh, uh, we have limitations, uh, you know, to say the least. We could probably get that up to maybe, you know, 700, 650 to 700 tons without doing a lot of work, but Beyond that, you'd have to start uh, additional excavation uh, to uh, to go much bigger than that, and that's really not practical uh, to be trying to do those things blasting around an operating mill. So we'd have to look for another site, and this is one down there uh, that uh, would be available now. Uh, this is for sale, uh, but it's a bit pricey, uh, so uh, we're, we're not in a hurry to do anything here, and we're the only game in town. So I think. Uh, I think we'll just uh, wait till uh, we get ourselves into production and then we'll see what we can possibly do. So with that, I'm going to stop and um, uh, take some questions. Excellent, there we go. Webcam going. Um, yeah, how did Arcana get this asset? And uh, are, there, are there royalties? And uh, before you answer, just want to encourage everyone to send his or her questions in. Just um, find your way to the question uh, panel there, and uh, it should be obvious. And uh, we'll we'll ask it right here. Okay, how'd you get the asset? Uh, say uh, I, I missed it. Uh, sure. How did you get uh, or can I come get this asset? And uh, did it come with any royalties or uh, complications attached? Uh, we, we got the asset, uh, it was brought to us by Lasco Resource Capital, and uh, they had um, uh, foreclosed on it from Fortune Minerals, who had previously owned the thing. Uh, they, they took it from Fortune, uh, spent a considerable amount of money, you know, upwards of 20 to 25 million doing pre-fees, feasibility, and, and updating feasibilities, and, and a lot of... Uh, actual um, uh, preparation, mining, and things like that. So it came in through an RTO that we did uh, in late 2018, where it was vended into Orcana for a portion uh, of the ownership of Orcana. The deal was done at 75% um, uh, for the uh, Revenue Virginia's mine uh, from uh, Lascaux Resource Capital and 25% of Orcana. So the ownership was 75-25 on that basis. There are some royalties on certain claims. They're capped out at $9 million uh, and are not terribly significant in the, in the great scheme of things here. Can you tell us a little bit about Lascaux Partners? Lascaux Resource Capital is a, is a, is a fund. Um, I think they're... Uh, they're uh, based out of uh, Connecticut. Uh, they are uh, currently a 31.7% owner of, um, of Orcana. They have two members on the board. Uh, they have been extremely supportive of, uh, of this project going forward and, uh, and in the past, uh, to say the least. So, uh, you know, uh, we continue with their support and they, uh, they certainly provide lots of guidance and whatnot for myself, which is good you know, great help. Uh, so uh, yeah, that's uh, that's what they're doing right now is uh, um, hoping to get this into production as we all are. And they stand to make their money on the equity piece, the same as uh, all the rest of us do. 
Okay. Uh, what will be the impact of the mill upgrades on recovery and operating costs? And um, tie into that, would, would you be willing to take third party ores and uh, let, make other high grade mines viable? Well, uh, in terms of the recovery, uh, yeah, uh, the, uh, all the work that we did on metallurgy uh, indicates about a 96, 95, 96 re recovery for, uh, for lead and for silver. Uh, gold is uh, around 68%, I think, uh, if I recall the numbers correctly, and uh, zinc is, um, is in the high uh, 85 to 88% uh, recovery on the zinc. Uh, and of course, the, uh, the gold and the silver go with the lead concentrate. We'll make two concentrates, the lead and the zinc, uh, and that's what we, uh, we ship off to the smelters. We have an off-taker, Trafigura, and they... Um, uh, they will take our concentrate. We get paid 95% at our gate, so our working capital issues are much, much minimized. And then uh, we uh, do final settlement on uh, smelter returns kind of thing. In terms of um, uh, third-party um, uh, milling kind of thing, uh, we certainly would not consider that at this point in time. Our focus is to get ourselves up and running to um, uh, you know, to the, the 270 tons a day, and make sure we've got our metallurgy and uh, you know productivities and costs and everything under control. Um, we're we're looking at uh, you know um, at taking our mill to full capacity organically ourselves. However, uh, you know, on any given point in time, you never say never. If uh, we had capacity in the mill, that uh, something that would make sense, uh, you know, we'd, we'd have to consider that on its merits. Okay, thank you. Uh, Stu? Thanks for the presentation, Kevin. Uh, so when would, you know, how many quarters of production do you think you guys would feel comfortable having completed before, you know, focusing on Shafter or allocating funds to Shafter? Well, you know, we're, we're looking to be cash flow positive here in September. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a fairly quick ramp up and start up, but, uh, you know, this mine has operated before and, and all of those great things. On Shafter itself, you know, we're, we're already doing a fair bit of work. We're, uh, we're uh, updating our resource. Uh, we've done a fair bit of work behind the scenes, and we hope to be able to publish a new resource on Shafter within the next month or two. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping it'll be closer to a month rather than the two, but you never know. Um, and uh, we, we see Shafter from where we're sitting right now as, you know, certainly at the silver price where we're seeing at 27 bucks, 26 as being quite viable mine, uh, you know, with somewhat, something like, you know, a, a seven to 10 year mine life and a, a two and a half to three year, um, uh, two and a half to three million ounce uh, producer. Um, we need to do a feasibility study. I mean, this thing was put into production previously in 2012 under a PEA, and, and that's just a recipe for disaster, in my opinion. So we need to do uh, the update to our resource. We will probably need to poke a few holes for, for we, we see the possibility of expanding the resource on the fringes at Shafter, and we, uh, we need some uh, fresh sample for, um, for metallurgical study. So you know, all things being equal uh, and, you know, with, with everything working the way we hope, we would hope to get into a feasibility study later this year uh, and uh, be in a position to make a production decision, uh, you know, early next year kind of thing on uh, assuming a positive uh, uh, yeah. feasibility outcome. And in the expiration drilling, how many meters of feet would you be planning? Oh, uh, we'd be something in around a 15,000 feet of drill program, probably 4,000 feet of uh, drilling for sample. Yep. Okay. And uh, like high level, like what would be some of the major changes, you know, in costs or the market between the PA that was historical at Shafter and, you know, what's going to be updated in the feasibility? Yeah, well, I need to do the feasibility report. Okay. To you that. <laughs> Uh, you know, I, we don't know, right? We we see price pressures. Uh, although, you know, from looking from what we see for the for the new resource, uh, we're not looking at doing anything that our Canada did previously in the in the Presidio area, which is you know just remnant mining kind of thing. Uh, this is a pristine resource. It's rather flat lying. 
Uh, it's got some pretty good thicknesses that we can see. We, you know, we see this as a uh, probably a room and pillar. You might even be able to mine this with a continuous miner. So there's some, uh, you know, real opportunity, I think, to lower the cost uh, from what it uh, might have been previously. Uh, and to uh, you know, go all electric rather than any kind of diesel. Just use the ramp that, uh, not use the ramp that's there, uh, but use uh, you know, there's a thousand foot uh, uh, shaft with a hoist and everything already there. So um, you know, I, we see it as being maybe uh, something comparable to what you see in the PEA. Okay, great. Thanks for that. I pass to Arnie. Thank you. Um, what is your stope size kiln? Our stopes are uh, 500 feet long by 300 feet high. They're big. Just stopes. one single production stop, I meant. Uh, there's there will be two in production at any given time, and we'll be mining from both ends of each um, of each stope. So uh, you know, for 270 tons a day, you need a 90 foot cut per shift. Uh, for those, uh, so you know, we've we've got some, uh, and of course, we'll have two stopes in reserve before the end of this year is up. Uh, and uh, you know, you you in this kind of mining where we're doing narrow vein, you you certainly need at least one stope in reserve. And when we look at the technical parameters of your mill and the mining method, how much uh, mining dilution you can you can allow your uh, miners? Well, if you look at the mill, I mean, you know, for startup at least, we uh, we got a mill that's designed at 550 tons a day, and we have a, a feasibility study that's done at 270. So we have double the capacity. Uh, but all of the test stoping, and there was considerable. We did four different runs of test stoping here to prove up the mining method, which is a resu mining method, which really means it's split blasting. We go in. Our stopes are about four foot wide. Uh, our ore vein is about one and a half feet wide, and the other uh, two and a half feet is, is waste. So we go in, we drill up uh, the, the uh, ore, uh, and we also drill the waste, but we load and blast the ore down onto a, 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 a rubber conveyor. Uh, so we take the ore out first, and then we come in and we blast the waste, and that's what we stand on to take our next cut. But uh, through those uh, test stoping runs that we did, uh, the average dilution, uh, and we used uh, very experienced miners down to completely inexperienced miners in the process to get a good cross section of what uh, you know a, a, an individual miner might deliver uh, in terms of dilution. And the average of all of that came out to about 20% dilution. Uh, we anticipate that you know we we should be able to do ourselves 25%, maybe it'll be 30% dilution on a on a continuous basis. But even when you look at even if it's higher dilution, because you've got the mill that's double the capacity, uh, you could take 100% dilution and your 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 uh, your actual costs don't really change because no matter what you do, it's a question of uh, the waste, you know, you either leave it in the stove or if you dilute your ore, you wind up taking it to the mill. Uh, so with that added capacity in the mill, you know, we'll certainly have time to focus in on our dilution. We also did some work on, um, on uh, um, uh, sorting, <laughs> sorting. <laughs> or sorting. Uh, we haven't done any optical work, but we did do some gravity uh, uh, separation work, and uh, you know that looks very viable. And we've looked at, you know, if we do get into an issue where we see uh, higher dilution than what we planned and can't solve it through, uh, you know, just better better controls underground, then uh, you know we could look at putting in an ore sorter kind of thing. And these things are, you know, they're they're kind of a million bucks, so uh, pretty easy to deal with. Hope that answers the question. Yes, uh, thank you. So you said you 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 have higher capacity. You will have higher capacity in the mill. So uh, excess amount you can handle. Yeah, but we we really don't expect to see anything really higher than a thirty percent dilution based on what we've already been able to do uh, in in our mining sequence. And for us to understand the mining, uh, like. Can you comment on the inter interdependence of your uh, production activities? 
Yeah, well, this type of mining, uh, narrow vein mining, the, the key to being successful at this is really to have your development of your stopes and your infrastructure far enough out in front of you so that your production is never dependent on you getting your you know uh, your your development done on a daily basis that you've always got uh and as i started out you know uh, we need two stopes for continual production you you want at least one stope as a spare because sooner or later something will happen in one of those stopes that you need to take people out and do some work or whatever and you need a place to go to maintain your production so that's key for us. We, we are focused on getting that development done far enough out in front of us so that we never have to worry about where the next you know, day's ore is coming from. Uh, and and that, uh, for this kind of mining, that's what we have to do. And we're very focused on ensuring that we've got all of the, the uh, necessary production six months to a year out in front of, of our current needs. And uh, my last question for us to uh, for investors uh, to feel better about your uh, block model, uh, how much reconciliation work has been done when we look at the development works and uh, uh, these three test stops you mentioned? Uh, how how the grade numbers came up? Well, we haven't. Uh, we we did the original drilling and the sampling that we did, uh, where the vein was open, and from the historic works. All of the work that we've done up to now has been development in waste to put our our, our infrastructure in place. So consequently, we've not been able to reconcile back with the uh, with the feasibility model. But certainly, you know, we're days away from accessing the uh, actual uh, Virginia's vein on the 1800 level. We have an expectation of what we're going to uh, begin mining, what the grades and the widths and so on will be. But until we get there and get that sampling done uh, and open the vein up, we we just don't know. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, Adam? Adam, we don't have any audio. Um, Adam, while you're, yeah, uh, figuring that out. Any um, audio now? Yes, thank you. Okay. Oh, that didn't work. Uh, let's just talk a little bit about ownership, um, institutions, and large individual owners. Uh, we, we've got, I believe, uh, around 30 funds in us right now. We've just picked up some institutional uh in our last uh, equity issue that we did in january out of the uh, out of the uk and europe um the largest shareholder of course is uh alaska resource capital which owns 31.7 percent and probably management i mean between uh, alaska uh, they're they're of course on the board and management in its entirety were probably around 35 maybe 36 percent ownership and the rest is is widely held through either retail uh or the 30 funds that are, uh, are invested in this. um have you made any concessions in your cost planning for en energy increases uh uh that's a good question and yeah we're, we're anticipating that we're going to be seeing some uh, energy uh, increases we're not fossil fuel based at all we're pretty much an all electric mine um, where underground we use uh, its track so battery operated uh, you know char rechargeable uh, train locomotives and and so on uh, and we don't use any uh, major pieces of equipment so to that extent uh, but on on the back of the electricity you know we see here in Colorado and, and of course uh, you know based on the, the Paris Accords that the US is now uh, 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 bought into uh, we see coal being um, you know phased out and probably 30 percent of our power is generated by coal from the san miguel power corporation so we see that and i think long term they're they're looking at convert uh converting to uh, uh that coal fired into uh, natural gas uh we don't anticipate any um uh, you know near-term increases but you know, going forward over uh, certainly over the coming years as uh, as the renewable energy 
uh, drive is, uh, you know, in more enforced kind of thing that we could expect to see uh, increases in uh, power rates. Okay, Adam, do you have audio? Okay, uh, would you consider being taken out? What's the sort of thought at the board level on? Uh... Well, of course, uh, you know, you, you never say never, right? But, uh, you know, we, we certainly feel that we have, um, getting ourselves into production uh, will release, you know, a considerable value that currently I, I don't think is being recognized in, in the market. I think one of the things that we, uh, you know, I speak for myself here and, and that this is a decision by the shareholders and the board of the company, but I think there would be uh, a way better value merging with some, uh, you know, uh, equal of ours or close to an equal of ours as opposed to getting gobbled up by a, a big company like, you know, a Kirkland Lake or, or somebody like that. I, we we kind of just get lost in in that big uh, uh, framework that they have. So, uh, but uh, you know, I, I think uh, everybody knows that uh, you know a one mine company kind of thing not necessarily uh, the way to go long term. So yeah, I mean the, the reality of it is that that we would uh, you know entertain uh, um, a merger uh, of uh, you know or an acquisition or uh, you know. Uh, those kinds of things are, you know, if something comes along for us, we would certainly entertain um, uh, acquiring something as well. And we do, of course, have the, uh, the, the Shafter project, you know, to bring online. So I think there's a lot of value here. There's probably a lot more value if we uh, if we have a little bit more mass. Uh, some point. Adam. All right. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Half eight. <laughs> Fourth time. Great. Great, Kevin. A couple of quick questions. One, uh, perhaps you could flip back to the cross section um, where you were showing the the Alamac raises. And uh, and as you do that, another question for you, Kevin, is um, in regards to your offtake deal, um, the the ninety five percent that you're going to get from Trafigura. That's on a that's on a payable basis. Yeah. So you you yeah. know so so roughly uh you know ninety you, you get you got roughly ninety six percent estimated mill recovery on your lead and your silver and then yeah. you're gonna and then there's and then you're subject to the to the payable uh, rate um, and then and then the ninety six sorry the ninety five percent that Trifigura gives you that's on top of that. Yeah, they would give us 95% based on our assays of the concentrate at our gate. So if you know our recovery is 96% of what comes from the mine, kind of thing, right? Uh, so, but whatever is contained, and typically, you know, our concentrate is looking at 350 ounces per ton of silver. So it's uh, you know high high uh, high profits uh, uh, concentrate. So we would get to say uh, pay 95% uh, of that value. Not, so there. Okay, that's that's a little confusing to me because there should be another payable rate in between there, um, you know, because Trifigura is not going to get 96% uh, of uh, of the contained, uh, so uh, there must be another rate in between. Well, there's a, there's a final settlement. Don't forget, right? Uh, there's a final settlement from smelter returns, and that's where everything is is. Uh, Short up. Don't forget, Traffy is making their money on the the TCs, the RCs, the penalties, the you know those kinds of things, right? Uh, so getting back to this cross section here, I I noticed the uh, I, I can't quite see it from here, but what is that? The it, the internal shaft there looks like it's called the Virginia shaft or something. This one here, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Is that is that something that you guys? Where's your second access? You know, uh, or is it just that the, the the three raises make up both primary and secondary access? Our, our primary access is in right here on the 2000 level. This is the main haulage level goes out to surface. Yeah. Um, and this right here is called a hub read raise. This is a raise bore, eight foot raise bore. It has a uh, an elevator in it for, and it's connected to all of the levels. So this is our second means of egress. Okay, and then from from your level, say from the fifteen hundred level, 
Yep. Pri which, which one is going to be the primary access then? Uh, all up through number one, it comes in right here. And on the 2000 level, up number one, this is where the hoist is. So our, our access to 1800, 1500, and 1200 is through here. Okay. And then uh, are, the, are your new levels going to connect? So, for example, the 1200 level, is that yeah. going to connect to the old level? Uh, to the to the left there. No, it does not. No, we're staying away from 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 there. It doesn't connect into that. Are you trying to stay away from the from that shaft, or what's the? It looks like there's a lot of ore left over there. Uh, there really isn't a lot of ore. This has been all mined out. Uh, but don't forget, you got uh, shaft pillars around there, so you don't want to be in there fooling about that. So we've we've uh, these are, are really sterilized uh, areas in here that we don't want to touch for stability reasons. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then, uh, as you're as you're moving to the right there on your levels, yeah. you know, is is that just an arbitrary cutoff, kind of based on the you know your level of a, a drill density? Uh, yeah, it's it's the Mahogmahila claim, which is this one right here. Yeah, that's where it just cuts off. I mean, we really don't have any information over here. But you um, own it. Pardon me. But you have ownership and control of all that ground. We have con ownership and control of all of this, all the way at full 8,000. I think it's probably a little bit more than we call it 8,000 feet. But uh, we didn't own this bluegrass claim before. And uh, that was the interruption. We now own that. So uh, when we did our, our, you know, when we did this, uh, uh, this diagram that we've got here, we just, because this is, is the feasibility study, don't forget. And don't forget the green that's here is inferred and is not in the feasibility study. So really it's only this here and here, but the reality of it is we're gonna mine it all. Uh, so that's what we're setting up our, ourselves to do here. And then we, you know, the, 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 Adam, the, the, the likely thing that's gonna happen here is that we're, we're, get, we're coming up right here. This is on this plan section here. And we're coming into the 1800 and this is the vein. We're going this way and that way. So we'll have two headings. And this will get into two stopes here very, very quickly. This stope on this side, stope on this side. But as we push out here on the development level, you know, as that vein is in front of us, we're just going to keep going, you know, for, for that full uh, 8,000 feet. I mean, we'll just keep going on the 1,800, the 1,500, the 1,200, and the 900. But none of that is in the feasibility study. Kevin, does that 2,000 level... Um keep going to the to the west be up under all the previous workings and all the way to the to the uh to the end of the of the previous um uh mined out ore yeah it goes right to here uh right right to the end of the mahogany hill it it uh is where it stops right now so yeah but um, does it go west does it go west there uh uh yeah yeah, right, right here. Yeah, uh, no, it doesn't go past here right now. We would have to drive it further out here. It stops. It stops right here at the end of the Mahogany Hill claim. But it's it's eight, and here it is on plan view. It, this is a surface right here. So it goes in, and it goes right to there. That's the end of it. So that's roughly eight thousand feet of, uh, of the two thousand main haulage level. Lost uh, audio, Adam. All right. Well, we're we're um. Oh, well, that much keeps it. happening. There we go. Okay. So, Kevin, none of the old levels uh are uh are um are accessible or usable. They are accessible. Uh, we've um we've been up in a couple of those stoves, but you know that that'll be a lot of a lot of work for uh, and and you know they did a good job of mining. This, this area right here out. And uh, probably the most important thing from here, Adam, is basically the information that was left behind from the old workings, uh, especially out here on, on the fringes, right at, at uh, these workings. We have virtually all of that information of you know, how wide the vein was, how wide the, the pay streak was, what the assays are, uh, and so on. And, and there is some mind-blowing uh, assays out here for silver and for gold. They did drive the 1400 drift out here, probably to the L in the exploration. 
uh, and they sampled all of this, and we have that information as well. So this area right here is uh, extremely likely that we will mine this without question. You know, we put a mine plan to it uh, a year or two ago uh, and put some costs and whatnot to it, and we see that you can't drill this thing. That's the unfortunate part. So you got to go underground. You got to get developed out here. You got to you know come up with the the the, uh, the raises and, and develop the levels and get in a position to drill it. And uh, we thought that that would be about around a buck an ounce, just under a buck an ounce to do that. But when we did some arm waving with the numbers and everything that we saw there, we didn't use those numbers. We used the average grade of the deposit as we know it today, which was 37 ounces and the average width of a, of a foot and a half. And we come up with, uh, on a 50% conversion basis from a resource into a reserve, uh, you know, we'd come up with 25 million reserve ounces uh, at an exploration cost of about a buck an ounce. Uh, but if you, uh, you know, anybody who knows anything about narrow vein mining and developing underground, of course, is that if you got to do it from underground, you've probably already spent 75% of your mining costs in the exploration. So it would be pretty cheap to mine once you've got the exploration done. My audio cut out again, just at the last second there. Um, but a, a question, Kevin, um, as you guys have been accumulating, you know, additional claims, you know, have you had to deal with the, uh, you know, the old timey, uh, 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 type of claims that are, uh, you know, where you go down, where you know, where they own everything down dip. Yeah. Yeah, well, in Colorado, there's apex law uh, prevails, of course. So if you own the apex of a vein, you own it no matter where it goes. And, you know, that is the law of the land here for sure. And and as you've been buying, trying to accumulate those claims, uh, you know, have you been giving the, uh, to convert them to modern claims, have you been, you um, giving the underlying holders royalties? No, well, the claims that we've picked up, and especially these, these green ones that you see right here, these were claims that uh, primarily uh, the um, uh, from Newmont uh, that were owned by Idorado, and uh, they were given back to the Forest Service. So uh, we, we went to the Forest Service and, um, and uh, asked, uh, you know, can we have these claims back? So that's uh, that's how we've uh, we've acquired these and so you know do you have any claim yeah sorry do you have any any residual royalties on individual claims or or is it is that mostly how did that get cleaned up if, if it was cleaned up well there's there's uh, there are some residual uh royalties on some of the claims like there's some claims that we have that's uh, five percent uh, uh that are the uh, 5% of the claim that's on uh, kind of thing. But the, the overall royalty that we've built into our economic model here, I, I think it's, uh, I can't remember the exact uh, amount of the royalty in terms of percentage, but I, I know it caps out at 9 million, uh, given the price of uh, gold or the price of silver doesn't go over, I don't know what it was, 60 bucks an ounce or something like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But are you guys trying to? I have to get back to you on on the on the royalty uh, uh, stuff, Adam. I, I just don't have it off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. Are you guys trying to account for because of those royalties and whatnot? Are you guys trying to account for all your ore and, and ounces on a claim by claim basis? Yeah, we, we uh, well right now, and I, I guess no is is the question uh, with that. I mean, all we've accounted for in ounces is what you see here in the pink and the and the uh, and the purple. Uh, we have we have no resource really on any of anything else that we own at this stage. So it's only on the Mahogany Gila and and these uh, these other claims right here. And, and we've not done any exploration on any of the other eight veins that we own. We've not done any exploration on this out here or this out here on the on the uh, Virginia vein. A lot of upside. We lost she again, Adam. Kevin, as far as you know, the the you know on these other veins that are not in the resource, is the, the mineralogy effectively the same? 
Yeah, the the, uh, the the mineralogy, the metallurgy, probably even more importantly, uh, has been well demonstrated in the San Juans. It's pretty much all the same. I mean, if you look at the mills that were here uh, throughout this area, they all had basically the same flow sheet. Uh, very readily uh, floatable materials and uh, you know or gravity separation whichever uh, yeah so uh, but I mean some of the uh, you know for instance the yellow rose or the uh, wheel of fortune some might be higher in uh, in gold than silver some might be higher in copper than than lead or zinc but uh, uh, not that different excellent thanks I'll pass it back to Campbell in case there's any additional questions okay Jeremy Campbell. It's not me this time. Thank everyone for tuning in, and uh, we'll be queuing you for feedback on your way um, out. So please uh, get it to us, and we'll get it to Kevin very shortly thereafter. Replay will be available about an hour after we uh, wrap up at ambestcapital.com slash replays. And uh, with that, Kevin, I'll turn it back to you to close us. Well, thanks, everybody. Uh, I very much appreciated listening in and uh, taking an interest in Arcana. So uh, if you do have any questions, uh, you, know, you can certainly get me at uh, kdrover at orcana.com uh, if you want to deal directly. Thanks very much. Right. Bye.